When I say innovation, you might think of someone giving a keynote at a tech conference. It's become shorthand for new ideas spearheaded by companies with venture capital, open office plans, and dreams of low orbit spaceflight. But what if I asked you to think of libraries, public parks, and weekends? In their time, these things weren't just innovations, but huge, nearly unthinkable wins. And groups of citizens demanded them, not companies, but people, the public, using public resources to solve public problems. These radical innovations changed everyone's lives immensely, for the better, and in often unexpected ways. For instance, you go to the public library to check out a Zadie Smith book, maybe grab a video game and print some recipes from the internet. But sociologist Eric Kleinenberg also found that libraries save lives. The more parks and libraries in a neighborhood, the lower the death rate during the 1995 Chicago heat wave. Because if someone was absent from their local hangout, it was more likely a friend would go check in. These public resources may seem banal or ineffectual. How could buildings full of books or a field without buildings at all possibly have such an impact? But they do. Take high school, for instance, another public innovation. In 1910, only about 18% of American teenagers attended high school. But by 1940, that number was up to 73%. Working class parents made the case that public schools would teach kids to be informed and active participants in society. High schools paid for by taxes would benefit everyone. As Harvard University public policy professor Robert D. Putnam explains, most of the economic growth during the whole of the 20th century came from the decision to fund public high schools. It meant that we had a better educated workforce than any other country in the world. The task ahead, however, requires more than just pulling from the past's recipes. Scholar Danielle Allen argues that some of our finest public innovations, at best, didn't lift us all, but at worst, succeeded by keeping some of us down. Now we have to think about how we can first imagine and design a better internet that will serve society by serving us all equally. Roads, museums, public transit, public media, the result of meeting public problems with public solutions, not replacing the private sector, but working with it. The library and bookstores aren't competitors offering the same service, but compatriots offering complementary services. Even the internet began as an act of public imagination. The original technology was spun out of a Department of Defense research project that was commercialized in 1995. Since then, digital platforms have become host to an increasing amount of public discourse. Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Reddit, and so on are private spaces. They're owned by private companies, so they're designed with the goals of private companies in mind. These spaces are simply not built to handle the demands of large-scale public discourse, particularly different and global audiences. For spaces used by the public to function safely and effectively in their interest, those spaces need to have different goals. Maybe, like the social reformers before us, we can demand better of the internet, the platforms on it and the companies that shape it to address its private-public mismatch. We have met similar challenges before, again and again. Could we approach the improvement of global public life online with the same fervor as reformers before us approached weekends, public schools, or libraries? Challenging these norms may seem radical, but 80 years ago, demanding a 40-hour work week and two days off seemed similarly revolutionary. Really, what's radical is leaving such large-scale public problems unaddressed by public innovation. It's time to summon our public imagination. If parks and libraries can save lives and public high schools can kickstart nationwide economic growth, imagine the impacts of better digital public spaces used by billions of people.